So I want to talk about dialectic solutions to the Lyer paradox. So first of all, I need to tell you about the Lyer paradox, and then I need to explain this funny word dialectic, which has been invented recently. Uh, so the Lyer paradox is the paradox that arises when someone tries to say of their, what they're actually saying at that time, that it's false. They're saying, I'm lying in this very utterance, I'm lying, or this utterance is false. It seems rather strange, and uh, the, someone might even want to do this, uh, but if they do, then it's going to undermine our theory of truth, or so it would it seem. And the argument goes like this. Uh, supposing what I say is true, when I say that what I say is false, then if it's true, then surely that's how things are, and I've said that it's false, so if it's true, it's false. But that means, assuming it's true, it's both true and false, and surely nothing can be both true and false. So the assumption must be wrong. It can't be true. It must be false. However, if we conclude that when I said that what I was saying was false, that I was actually what I was saying was false, then that's how things are. So I must have been saying something true. So it seems we have an easy proof that what I'm saying now is both true and false. And that's a contradiction. Uh, that it seems that uh, nothing can be both true and false, but we want to say that everything is either true or false. That they, uh, one of those principles has a name, it's called the law of bivalence, that there are two truth values and every sentence has one or other truth value. Well, you might think that we could escape this paradox by saying that perhaps this funny utterance, because it is a funny utterance anyway, is neither true nor false. Maybe it's the exception to the law of bivalence that we've been looking for. But then we can revise the paradox and put the paradox in the form, what I'm saying is not true. And if, if what I'm saying is not true, suppose that's true, then assuming it's true, things are as it says they are, so it's not true. But it can't be both true and not true, surely. So it follows that it's not true. We assumed it was true, got a contradiction, so it follows it's not true. But it said it was not true. That was the utterance. It said, what I'm saying is not true. And we've proved that it's not true. So things are as it says they are, so it must be true. So we're back in contradiction again, and we have a contradiction that it's both true and not true. Now that's uh, called the law of non-contradiction, uh, is the principle that nothing can be both in a certain way and not in that way. So take an example about the wall. The wall cannot be both white and not white. That's a contradiction, and contradictions can't hold around. Nothing can be both white and not white. But we've just shown that this utterance, this, uh, this funny sentence I came out with, this sentence is not true, that was both true and not true. So it seems to be uh, a counterexample to the law of non-contradiction. So you might wonder, well, why do philosophers emphasize the law of non-contradiction? What's so bad about contradictions? Well, there's an argument that goes back a long way in the history of philosophy that contradictions are a very bad thing that if we admitted contradictions into our theory, we could admit anything into our theory. So take the proposition we've just taken. Suppose we admitted that this sentence I'd come out with was both true and not true. Then in particular, it's true. But if it's true, then either it's true or the moon is made of green cheese. Okay, if it's true, then either it's true or the moon is made of green cheese. But we've also conceded that it's not true. So either it's true or the moon is made of green cheese, and it's not true. Well, if it's either one thing or the other, and it can't be the first one, it must be the second one. So if it's not true, then it, the moon must be made of green cheese. So if I admit that the sentence I uttered was both true and not true, I also seem to be committed to saying that the moon is made of green cheese and any other proposition you come up with. Uh, now, the, the principle right at the end there that I used, either the moon is made of green, sorry, either this sentence is true or the moon is made of green cheese and 
it's not true, therefore the moon is made of green cheese. That generalizes to the general form, either P or Q, and not P, therefore Q. And that's a standard principle of logic which is called disjunctive syllogism. You're moving from a disjunction and another premise to the conclusion from the denial of one of the disjuncts to the other disjunct as a conclusion, disjunctive syllogism. Now, a number of people have tried to give a solution to the liar paradox by embracing contradictions, but without being committed to any conclusion whatsoever. That's where the word dialethism comes in. A, a dialethia is any sentence which is both true and not true. It's dialethia from the Greek meaning two truth values. It's got both truth values, either it's both true and not true. So we're looking to see, could we embrace dialethi dialethic solutions to the liar paradox, but without this further implication that we would then be committed to any conclusion whatsoever. And the way to do it, they say, uh, is to reject disjunctive syllogism. Reject disjunctive syllogism as a means of argument. And we can see how they're going to do it in a way, because if they think that propositions can have both truth values, they can be both true and not true, that is, they can be both true and false, then we can see that the premises of the disjunctive syllogism argument are true, but the conclusion is false. And if we can show that an inference step has true premises and false conclusion, it's obviously not a principle that we want to have in our logic. So if we take P or Q and not P, now suppose P is both true and false, then if P is both true and false, then P or Q is both true and false, whatever Q is. But if P is both true and false, then not P is also both true and false. So P or Q and not P are both true and false, but they're both true. And the conclusion Q, in general, the moon is made of green cheese, is false. So if we accepted the principle of disjunctive system, we could be committed to moving from true premises to a false conclusion. Admittedly, there's a funny sense in which the premises are true, because they're not just true, they're also false. But the point is, you're moving from truth to falsehood, and that's a bad move to make in logic. So that looks as if we've got a viable solution to the liar paradox, if we're willing to revise our logic, go for what's called a non-classical logic, in which we reject the principle of disjunctive syllogism. There's a problem with this solution, however, and it comes out with another paradox, called Curry's paradox, due to a man called Haskell B. Curry. Uh, and this paradox was discovered uh, uh, around about the middle of the 20th century, though actually it was also known to logicians in the 14th century. Uh, it's quite interesting that it was hit on independently uh, by, both, by both groups. And this paradox uh, doesn't talk about uh, negation, doesn't talk about this sentence is not true or this sentence is false. It, talks about an implication. It says, look, just look at the sentence. If this sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese. Okay? If we take that sentence, if this sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese. Suppose that sentence is true. Okay? Then if it's true, it's, a, it's a, a true conditional with a true antecedent. Conditional being the inference from if the sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese. We're assuming that's true. And we're assuming it's antecedent, this sentence is true, is also true. And so by a principle known as modus ponens, very standard principle, given P, if P then Q, and given P, we infer Q, it follows that the moon is made of green cheese. We haven't yet proved that the moon is made of green cheese. We've only proved it on the assumption that the sentence is true. So we've proved that if this sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese. But hang on, that was the sentence we started with. The sentence was, if this sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese. And we've proved that if this sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese. So this sentence is true. 
So just looking at this sentence, if this sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese. We've proved that it's true. So it's true, but its antecedent was the sentence is true. So we've again got a true sentence, a true conditional, if this sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese, with a true antecedent. So by modus ponens again, we can infer that moon is made of green cheese. But that, that looks as if we've got there already, but last time we got to the moon is made of green cheese, that was on the assumption that the sentence was true. We really got rid of that assumption by saying, no, we've proved that if the moon is made of green cheese, sorry, if the sentence is true, then the moon is made of green cheese. And so we've proved already that the moon is made of green cheese without using disjunctive syllogism to get there. And this looks as if it might be a problem for the dialectic solutions. Now, what these solutions then want to do is they want then to re revise the theory of the conditional. Remember, the conditional didn't appear in disjunctive syllogism. Disjunctive syllogism was a principle about disjunction and negation, not about the conditional. So now the dialectic solutions are going to have to give a theory of the conditional that doesn't fall to Curry's paradox. Now, there are ways of doing that, and the way they usually do it is to look at a principle called contraction. Now, this really becomes a mouthful here. But in a way, what we've shown in the paradox is something of the form, if this sentence is true, then if this sentence is true, then the mood is made of green cheese. And we've contracted those two assumptions of if this sentence is true down to one occurrence of if this sentence is true, then the mood is made of green cheese. Or in general, we move from if P, then if P, then Q, to if P, then Q. And they think that thereby, that's where the problem lies with the conditional, is to contract that conditional. They think, think that assuming it twice is the same as just assuming it once. Now that may seem like angels on pinheads and drawing distinctions too far to go. And a lot of people would agree with you if you do think that. But that's the way that the non-classical solutions, the so-called dialectic solutions, go. They not only reject the principle of disjunctive syllogism from either P or Q and not P to Q. They have to reject that, otherwise they're committed to inferring anything from a contradiction. And they want to embrace contradictions. Not too many, perhaps, but certainly about the liar paradox and other paradoxes they want to say are both true and false or both true and not true but they're also going to have to give a novel and revised account of conditionals, and they're usually called non-contractive solutions. Uh, that means that they, don't, they, they have a theory of the conditional which doesn't admit the principle of contraction. So to sum up, uh, the dialectic solutions to the Lyra paradox, they accept everything there is about the theory of truth that other philosophers accept. Plus, they add to it the basic principle that it's possible for some things to be both true and false, for there to be true contradictions. But to do that, it means they have to revise logic. They find that basic principles that have been around for thousands of years, doesn't mean they're right, but logicians have embraced these principles like disjunctive syllogism and the contraction of antecedents. They have to uh, produce a logic which doesn't hold, which, which, which doesn't use those principles.